Yep. Hi there, this is Serana Telly and you're watching CMS TV. Stay colorful. you saw this article or not but uh it it, it was it, it was like a, a very slow news day obviously but um eddie trunk talked to the tesla boys or brian wheat specifically of tesla okay and brian brian basically said they're not going to do a uh an album any anytime soon and Fair enough. We, I mean, you know, and you can talk about it more than I can. Mm-hmm. Bands are going away from albums now. Like, right. It's just becoming a more of a singles thing. The albums don't have any value to you guys for the time that it, it's not worth the time you invest, I think is the best way to put it. Is that fair? Definitely fair. Definitely yeah. fair to say. But with this article, and this is why I wanted to bring this up. With this article, he says some things that I really need you to comment on because I know it isn't true for your band. It's not to say it's not true. It's not true for the way you work. Okay. Brian talks in here that the only way... Wait, let me try and find the quote. Um, I'll find it while I'm looking, but I, I, I'll tell you basically what he says. He says the main reason that nobody can record an album these days is because the only way to do a good album is to lock yourselves in a studio together for a year and hash it out through demoing. Mm. And I just, they're like the only band that still does that, right? Yeah, probably. I think most people are, are just sending each other stuff back and forth these days. I mean, maybe ultimately when they record the album, they go in somewhere together for anywhere from two weeks to a month if you're doing a full album. Get everybody in there and just kind of put the final touches on it of that live feel, perhaps. Because there is something that when you're when you're doing the, the handoff work mm-hmm. where, okay, I did my tracks, now you do your tracks. Sometimes it could come out good and it can work, but it could be a little stiff. Um, especially with like rock music. I think rock music needs to push and pull. Like a a song like Back in Black doesn't have a perfect uh, tempo. I think it it pushes on certain parts of it, and that's what makes it so awesome. And you can only do that really. I mean, I guess you could program, obviously, time changes, but it gets more uh, whatever. This is stuff that just real live bands kind of do together. Tesla is one of those bands, so I could I could dig it. But no, I mean you can maybe they don't want to do anything less than that. But a year together, a year of yeah, being together. That was the time that he, well he said, where's it at here? Um, he said just to do the one song that they just they just finished recording. It's not even out yet. This it's all about love song. They spent six months recording. Wow, six months. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That must be a pretty broad answer or description of it, of how it went down. Is that one guy working one one like for a month and then sending it to the next guy? I can't believe that, yeah, that, that these be guys that. could these guys could have been actively, okay, today we're going to work on drums or today we're going to work on the chorus. You right. know, I, I don't believe for mi- 6 months for one song. That just sounds nutty. Right. Well, I mean, their their schedules within the band. I don't know how that works. I mean, they're all playing. They never seem they're like together. They're, yeah, they're together. <laughs> it seems like they're always on the road. Yeah. So they're obviously not in one location for six months. I yeah. mean, but I could understand, you know, maybe a week somewhere. But you would think at this point in their careers, one of those guys would have a legit studio in their house or something. And I have to. Th- I know that Hannon does. I mean, Hannon has his own record company. For God's sakes. Yeah. He has he has a studio. 
Nowadays, the- there's no reason why they can't do something that sounds as good as mechanical resonance. Yeah. Re- Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, resonance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's no reason they couldn't do that in a house setup recording with Pro Tools or Logic or something. I would think that they'd be able to do that. Yeah. I mean, and you know that that Tesla level band's going to have a little better. I yeah, mean, they might go to a real place. I don't know. Here's the quote. It's different now. See, what people don't realize, for a band to make an album that's really great, you have to get locked in a room for about a year and really hash it out and argue and make demos. And then what you're doing is you're fabricating 10 songs and you'll usually have two great ones and then the other ones that are kind of (laughs) half-ass written unless you spend that time doing it. Right. Now, look. How I'm gonna go two records back for you. How long did you guys take to write to write and record Smash? Well, that that's the problem. I mean, really, both of those records, Smash and View to a Thrill, I had written the music part of it, not the vocal part. He mm-hmm. he he did his vocals, but all the music aspect I had been writing on my own time, right? Where I wasn't getting paid for that. I had reflected today upon uh, View to a Thrill where i was all in on that trying to write it It was like and that one was a lot harder because smash had already come out and then this next one had to be out in the next six months right so i really put everything into that for better or worse but i remember one point my electricity got turned off okay at my apartment yeah Mm -hmm. and the and the this uh the woman i was dating actually like helped me out and paid it was like 300 bucks for a one bedroom apartment that was like several months behind right uh on it um so i wasn't paying my bills it was i was just um sitting in there locked in my apartment trying to write enough compositions good enough stuff that he would be able to do something with it when we ultimately went into the studio which that part took close to 10 probably 10 days plus the mixed days so you know looking at like two weeks to do those records on average right. but all the writing part most of that was me doing these demos the best i could do at home we ultimately had a the real drummer uh greg d'angelo the first on smash and then mm-hmm. scott coogan on view to a thrill would come in we'd take we'd take my he would listen to what i did on the drum machines and then play their version of it okay over over the tracks i would be able to do stuff like my guitar solos at home and just kind of email those over sure (laughs) for some reason those sound better like that than when you try to like do it through a real amp but uh rhythm guitars i would i would go up to mats and we would uh hash those out so the instruments were were real you know uh Mm -hmm. on those records we took the time to track them we had steven come in got the best performances we could get from him and you know spiffed yeah. it up a bit and, and and got it going but that's where we are today you know when rat was doing their records in the 80s with Bo hill there was like millions of dollars on the line I right mean, they were spending sure. easy a million dollars back then mm-hmm. you know which was god knows how much money that would be at least three times that today yeah but i don't think if, if if anybody listens and I and I, I like to point to Smash, I just think Smash is the better record personally. Right, right, right. But um if somebody listens to Smash and then they go and listen to oh Detonator. That's one of the that's before the breakup, right? Detonator. Right. That was their last yeah. record before. Yeah, that's one was Shame, Shame, Shame and Love and Use yeah. Job and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if they go and listen to Detonator and they go and listen to Smash, I don't think that there's like any sort of uh audio quality drop off in fact i think that it's pretty close actually right. i mean it, it doesn't sound exactly the same because it's obviously different guys but sure but it, it's sonically right as solid it doesn't sound sterile which is what i think brian is trying to say here is that if you do it through trading and whatever it gets sterile because it's not the guys in a room i don't know if you guys just did it really well or if it's the you know if maybe brian is not aware of doing it that way so he has a perception of how that goes yeah i mean we the record might have been different if we had the time where okay i have my ideas of how the drums should go but i'm just going to come in with my guitar and play you these riffs and you 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 play the drums how you think they should go well you you go about it that way it's going to drag it out you know what i mean and everybody's Mm going to have their opinion what's better it can open up arguments 
um the way these went down it was more like steven and i's record matt of course thorn engineering it and playing sure. his bass and putting in his two cents of kind of being the tiebreaker if we, we, we were at a question about how something would go and he's the most musically inclined you know so when it came to like uh what key we should have him sing in or a note he should hit he could get on the guitar and figure out what the right harmony note would be or something right. like that easier than he and i would I mean, we, Steve and I both have great ideas, but we're not like highly musically, you know, right? Uh, trained and like it, with Rat, they had Bo Hill, you know, producing. They had a more seasoned person like organizing the whole thing. So we didn't have that. We didn't have really a producer aside from on Smash. I can't take it was given to Bo Hill, and he did do a mix of it for us. It was pretty cool, you know. And he had some sure. good ideas. He a couple of his ideas went on the final thing you know to to do a solo in the beginning i i did that he edited the solo slightly so it came in again at the end um he had cool ideas he did with steven's voice you know he was the one who repeated mm -hmm. some of the lines so it, there's there's these hit maker guys that know how to make something a little more catchy for the radio sure <laughs> or whatever that the band doesn't always have um now he just worked on that one song the rest was just us kind of self-producing and it was really just you know probably you know i i kind of self-produced the demos to to pretty much the same as they are it's just obviously sonically they needed to be done in a more pro place sure. matt had that i agree with you like for tesla i think they should be able to get something on par with mechanical resonance uh out of a place like at least mats or something not some yeah i don't know what what frank has at his house i don't know how good that that setup is or not has he ever released his record company has they've released music that's been recorded there and it sounds fine it sounds fine so yeah yeah i don't it shouldn't take all that time but what takes time is writing the stuff is everybody or is the band writing it together or is a situation like me where i was like doing all this work and then you know and to do it again i would really need to get all the ducks in a row and have yeah. a, a good payday involved because that's just like working on something for six months where the other players are brought in more as right. just a hired guy for the day hey we need drums for a day or two mm -hmm. you know what i mean they're not getting a residual thing they didn't like write the songs you right know what i mean and maybe it's um, maybe it's too it could be the creative way they do business as well right like like, I don't think Steven is a guy that sits there and listens to every note. I think Steven no. listens to it and is like, that's cool. I like <laughs> it. He has he puts in his two cents, but yeah, well, he's if he doesn't have to be there to do his singing part, he's not gonna be there while the guitars are being done. Yeah. Or the he shows up, hey, it's it's vocal day. We need you here. So he comes in. He's also hearing the rough mixes from the day of as the music gets developed, he gets a, a rough of the of it that day to kind of right see what he thinks of how it's going or if he has an idea about something does he um, write lyrics too does he write all yeah. the lyrics he writes, he, he the writes lyrics? most of his lyrics okay. you know um there was you know we'd help him with a line here and there you know mm -hmm. or just had a uh something on the melody line but he would do a lot of that i don't want to say secretly but just separately yeah really so i mean we if i had known what he was going to sing would it have changed how i did it you know maybe right. Do you, know? you, do you give him ideas and i'm asking because i really don't know yeah. like do you say yeah i hear this tune and i'm thinking about the illuminati like on 10 miles wide i <laughs> no. mean do, do you do you have that thought and then you relay it to him and then he writes something to it or do the you only just thing, give him a piece of music and he thing, said oh cool sure the only thing that i would put to, to besides the vibe of the music itself is i'll put like a working title okay for it and sometimes like 10 miles wide was just a something i just thought up and put it as the working title and he ended up liking that and using it as part of the lyrics which he'll often do you know okay. uh, but then there's times where he doesn't and he just totally changes the title of it it could go either way um there was there was situation <laughs> one funny one on um smash was the song jamie where he was doing he he I don't, I don't remember what he was doing exactly but I, it wasn't that great or we had criticized that we could probably do something better okay. and i had said this this is like a a big city night scorpions you know kind of right. chorus i'm looking for here and then he was like uh you know hey jamie hey jamie nights <laughs> <laughs> nice. he put nights i go you can't say nights 
<laughs> uh, but, it's her name, Jamie Knights. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, you know, I, I ended up then singing on it. I, I did the, you know, uh, can you hear me calling? Um, you can hear in the background like an right. answer to it, which was what I sang to him that I heard that, you know, and so okay. I just went in and sang it. So there's times where I've, I've actually do I, myself. I sing on the record here and there. Um, but this was like, as I was saying, just mostly between uh, Steven and I and Matt kind of, and then anybody else who played kind of came in drums, okay. usually just drums and got the drummer and then they left. So it's anyway, it's a lot of work, man. I was thinking for me to do a whole album, like to, to, to it would be six months. I would need six months to write, uh, an album from scratch that was any good. Okay. So you do know? you agree with Brian then that you would have to write 10 songs to get two good ones? Or would you write 10 and keep working on those 10 until they mm -hmm. were good ones? That's probably accurate. But I mean, in rock, it was like that for a long time. Right. You know, where you were lucky to get two good songs and then a lot of filler. And if there was some like uh, album that was like a top 10 diamond album, they probably did throw a lot of money at it and spend a right. lot of time. The wall right. or whatever. <laughs> How many songs? See, I, I this is fascinating to me because I don't know any of this stuff. How many songs generally, and they don't even have to be full songs, but it could just be like song ideas or, you know, parts of a song or a full song. Do you come up with, and then once you get to the phase where you're trying to add lyrics to it, you just realize it ain't going to work. Like you just, like you write something, you're confident in it, even if it's half a song or a riff mm -hmm. or whatever, you give it to Steven and he tries 15 different things and it doesn't work. And then you finally say, yeah, this isn't meant for Steven. Does that right. happen? Oh, yeah. Um, but I usually like will we'll try to have some idea of something in my head, but I don't try to influence him in any way. Like, right. let's see what he does with it first. And then when we get into the studio, if it's I'm not liking what he had or I think what I have in my head's better, I'll like, oh, what about this? Right. And then I might even get on the mic in the studio and sing it as a guide track. And then he might go, yeah, I like that. Okay, let me try to follow that. And he'll sing it or do it kind of more his way. But he definitely has his delivery that's his way and mm -hmm. certain ways that he'll phrase things or words he'll use where he'll, he's like, I wouldn't say that. I would say something like this. And right. So even if we gave him an idea, he's probably going to change that a little bit right? Uh, too. And he does, though, to your question writes most of his lyrics and he's doing it at home usually old school just listening right. to it getting it in his head writing some chicken scratch out on a notebook pad but, dude um, i'll tell you what's weird about him is i don't think many people for as much music as he's done both with rat and as a solo artist and with all his other bands you know vertex vicious delight you know all, all the different stuff that he's done arcade I don't think a lot of people realize how musical that guy really is. And it's only like, I'll, I'll just tell you from my own perspective, it's only been recently on Facebook. I see him plucking away at a guitar a lot, right. like a lot more than I'm going to be honest up until probably five years ago. I didn't even realize he played guitar. <laughs> I had no idea, you know, and I, and I know what, and what's weird is I know I've seen him play guitar you know, like in arcade when they would do Mother Blues, you you know, when I right. when I saw him do Mother Blues with arcade in 90, whatever year that was, um, I remember him and who was the guitarist in that? Was that Frankie? Frank Wilsey, Donnie. Yeah. Yep. I, I remember them sitting down and him playing it. But I honestly, because I was young and naive, I guess, thought that it was one of those um, Vince Neil playing guitar things where he's not really playing guitar. He's just. Right holding a guitar because it looks good you know yeah. it, it, you know i really thought that's what it was that steven wasn't really playing it's only been recently that i realized you know he could play guitar and not not just at an average below average level like he could sort of play guitar right yeah um vicious delight tour which was like a small club tour he did he did play he had he played guitar and he had one other guitar player up there okay. and that was kind of cool um in arcade, I don't know how how much he was coming through the PA or whatever. On right. That. Uh, but um, what I liked about Steven's career is he was pretty stylistic. Like he 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 put out different stuff. You know, he had mm -hmm. that rat 
stuff but then he he had uh arcade which was a more classic rock kind of aerosmith vibe yeah mm-hmm. um then he did like the industrial thing with vertex, vertex yeah. yeah so he likes all different kinds of music and he at some point put out some stuff like that and then within our records we kind of did a potpourri of all that you know yeah kind of stuff too we'd have zeppelin stuff some rat stuff some priesty kind of um things i thought smash was kind of all over the place because it was a lot of demos from all uh from the previous like eight years of us sending ideas to each other and then the next one the record we did was more you know recently uh written but it would be interesting to do a record with good other good musicians where you are locked in a room and you you got to make this happen and you put all your musical strength together you probably would get better stuff i mean when humans get together uh multiple ones and put their minds together amazing things happen i can only do so much by myself you know it's like a one dimension (laughs) right to enter the next dimensions you need some more brains in there sure you know going back to what you were saying about steven you know and his musical taste he's still doing that you know, like the, the the cover that you guys just did not, I can say what it is now, right? Because I think I saw it on online. The Dion one? The Dion? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, he did The Wanderer. Now, right. in, in my mind, if I'm thinking, all right, what song is Stephen Piercy going to cover? Yeah. That's going to be about number 10 million on the list. <laughs> that's not going to, you know, that's just not going to be one of those songs that you'd pick. But then when you listen to it, it works. It, it, and and <laughs> his his kind of sleaze metal voice thing that is him, like it, it doesn't sound like he's trying to do something outside of him. It sounds no. very Stephen Piercy, very rat, but <laughs> yet f- very 1965 as well, which is very cool. And you get credit for that too, because right. you, I could tell for a fact that you didn't even know the song and you like learned it almost note for note before you yeah. started working on it. Right. I, I did know I'm, I was familiar with the wanderer from, Dino. were you? That's a, yeah, okay. that's a pretty, pretty big hit hit song. So mm-hmm. I, I remember hearing it It in the eighties. It would still get played a lot. Cause okay. it wasn't all that old then. Now you don't hear it quite as often. So he was definitely play into the older audiences of right. this, i think with that one but uh yeah that was an example of me doing the best i can on my studio here we've released a few songs in the last year at, like the single version as you were saying where bands mm-hmm. are just like, releasing like a song at a time and that's without really spending any money just time you know me having to program drums we did a duran duran cover yeah girls on, on film. film now that was uh yeah that was programmed now it takes time man it's almost takes longer to sit there and programming each kick and snare than right. having a real guy come in and just play for a minute you could probably within an hour get a couple great takes from a drummer instead of having to sit there and go do, 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 right you know having to do all that crap and get the hi-hats and make it try to sound like a real drum set and get the velocities of each hit that you're programming it's very time intensive i don't even know if steven realizes how time intensive it is when he goes hey why would do this and it's like <laughs> yeah well you're asking me to you know spend probably two weeks on doing creating right. something like that um but there's covers that he's wanted to do that didn't make it or i didn't send it over um one was uh apollonia <laughs> like a, like an apollonia song yeah song? sex shooter oh sex i know shooter. that song oh, yeah, yeah yeah sex shooter yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I wish you would have done that one. That would have been I, awesome. I, ha- I just, you know what? I found it, and it's like I did a, a version of it. It's like, you know, and it, it kind of on guitar was kind of cool, but I mean, Prince songs are going to be great, you know, yeah. whatever. He wrote it. Prince wrote it. Right. Yeah, it was I in, it was in just, Purple Rain. Yeah, but I was just like, oh, man, this is so off the wall for us to do this. I'm like, I actually never sent it. <laughs> I like did it i took all the time to do it and i'm going man i don't know i don't know if he's what i should have maybe sent it maybe i still can yeah. but i was like i don't know and what are some other ones we tried he wanted to do um adamant there was an adamant one that i laid out um 
dangerous but not serious dangerous but worth the risk no that's the rest no, right right i think he might have been inspired to write that title right. from from that <laughs> back then he was a big adam Ant fan but uh dangerous but, but not, not serious. serious yeah yeah that's adam same, Ant's amazing I and that's that, the man. same album that had goody two shoes on it i remember that right he's yeah. uh he's actually still out playing and playing a lot lately. adam Ant? yeah i had no idea he was still alive He's going to do that. The eighties cruise that we just did. He's going to be doing the one, the next one coming up. Right. For right. Uh, Royal Caribbean. You just reminded me of something. I'm going to take a hard shift on the topic here. Just, did you hear CMS at all on Saturday? I have not. Are you going to keep okay. this page up the whole show? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just not paying attention. I can't see you really. I'm just not paying no attention. Okay. There you but, go. Hi. Um, no. Um. So we were playing. And I don't want you to comment on this part. Okay. I'll just say what we were doing. And you can say, "Uh uh-huh. We were playing video of Sebastian on that cruise, annoying the piss out of the um, the, um, air supply guys. Like he he did a walk on on their sh- on their during their set, <laughs> and it was very clear that they didn't like having him there. Oh, so you don't think they knew he was going to walk out? I on think stage? they knew, but I don't think you'll. I'll just leave it to you, and I really don't right. want to get because I don't want to cause you a problem with Sebastian. I saw it. I watched some of it. If uh, you watch it again right. close, if you yeah. watch it, there's one part where Sebastian is singing like and he wasn't supposed to be singing mm. like it was before the song started and the one guy was like looking away from him like looking at his other guy and sebastian goes over and taps him on the shoulder like hey aren't you watching me you know <laughs> hey it's, it's here i want to do it yeah, this is where the chorus it's real no it's before the song even started he was doing like some weird karaoke version before the song started and then when he wasn't getting attention he ran over and tapped the guy on the shoulder and was like hey look at me yeah look at me doing your song it, it was it was really Which is scary because i don't think those guys are big dudes the air supply guys no good. and sebastian's it's, this giant person it was real cringe and then it was very clear that the other guy not the guy that has the good voice but the other guy mm-hmm. hated sebastian uh like he he walked to the other side of the stage and at right. one point sebastian was saying something and he just broke into singing <laughs> It was brutal. We were we were laughing our asses off at it. But Neely asked me to ask you if you guys were still on the boat when this happened and if you happened to be at the performance. And I told him I thought mm. that you had probably already gotten off the boat. Jason made my he he was the only one who got to stay, I think, for the whole ten days or whatever. Okay. We left. So no, I did not see that. I, I that would have been hilarious. So I did watch a video recently I happened to see. So I do know what you're referring to. Yeah. Um I thought we were so out of place, Sebastian and Piercy on this on this spe- Yeah, you know. That's what we in, said in too. It's like cruise. We were like, you know, it's it's like Ray Parker Jr. and um <laughs> right. Wang Chong and Yeah. You know, did I turn my mic? When off? in Rome, what happened here? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you if you can. Uh, hear me. I can't hear me. Something happened. No, but I can totally hear you. All right, well, as long as you can hear me. Mm. All right, there we go. I, I did turn it down somehow, but yeah, no, I, we we were just talking about that video, and and I I said the same thing on the on the CMS on Saturday that um I couldn't I could not fathom why you guys were on that gig other than pays the bills you know? yeah yeah those it's cruises fine. through are, you know are fun i mean they do t- totally take care of you and when you when you think of the value that mm-hmm. you're allowed to you know typically bring your family or what, what whatever it's a free vacation in a lot of ways because you're there for five six days sometimes more that that 80s cruise was like a 10 day thing yeah uh, we got off. We 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 didn't stay on this. We left after like the fourth day, I right? Believe, on the fourth day. Um, but the value, monetarily speaking, is usually that would be worth like three to five thousand dollars a person. Right. You know, sure. to to go have a cabin with a view, a port window and stuff. If if you yeah. the cheapest tickets, you're you're below 
you're below deck. Mm-hmm. There's no window. You're just in a small little room, a little closet right. or something. Um, you know, the rooms they give us are the are the suites in a way. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. they give the bands balconies and, and whatnot. Those would be super expensive if you're paying sure. for it. Um, they give you discounts, the ba- the bands discounts on the drink packages and uh restaurants and internet the internet that you pay for because that's where they get you too is internet you're going to be spending a good 30 bucks a day to Oof. have internet if you're addicted to posting stuff or getting right. on there wow, so the, yeah there's uh, now we're getting also you know compensated for playing on the thing too so that's pretty awesome you know yeah, you get really great payday for a week's work pretty much yeah and, and a little vacation to boot other than the you know hour or two that you got to work right Right. Um, and usually they, they have the, the best uh, people working at the shows and great equipment and everything. They, they, they're they definitely top notch in that, you know, area. Right. So I've, I've learned to enjoy it. I, 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 as you know, last year before the first Monsters of Rock one, I was pretty apprehensive. I did not want to go on it. I'm not a cruise guy. Right. But now after I've done a couple cruises, I've, I've, I know what's involved. I'm more relaxed about it. I don't have the anxiety anymore. Sure. Plus, I'm on these beta blockers. So <laughs> there yeah. you go. Well, let's do this, dude. Let's take a quick break. Um, we'll play a guitar for um some guy I know that's selling guitar picks. We'll play. <laughs> right. We'll play his commercial, and then we'll come back. And you said you got something you want to talk about too. So sure. Uh, hang tight, everybody. We'll be back in a second. It is Chris Aiken presents. It's the limited edition six big set from Eric Ferentino's. Get your autograph set today at ericpicks.cmspn.com. $25 includes first class shipping. What's going on, everybody? It is Chris Aiken from Chris Aiken Presents and the Seth Williams Show, and of course, the Classic Metal Show. And I know you need someone to be told something, right? Whether it's something nice, something not so nice. Maybe you need somebody fired and you just don't have the guts to do it. Maybe you need to tell your girlfriend to hit the pavement. Maybe you need to tell the boyfriend to hit the streets. Whatever it is, I got you covered. Right here with my cameo, cameo.com slash Chris Aiken. I will tell them, and I won't be nice, unless you want me to be. If you want me to be nice about it, I will certainly give the sweetest message possible. But if you need evil with a lot of F-bombs and a lot of words that I just can't even say on any sort of radio or TV program, I'll do that for you too. One more time, cameo.com slash Chris Aiken. Buy a cameo from me, and I will tell them like it is the way 